Welcome to our third video on sizing steel beams. We are focusing on wide flange beams because those are the most common steel beams. But the procedure that we're outlining applies equally well to all other shapes that might be used for steel beams. In previous videos, we have talked about using Excel as a preprocessor for load data. And we also talked about sizing the wide flange steel beams for stiffness. In this particular video, we're going to complete that sizing procedure by examining the impact of moment strength in the sizing of the beam. To refresh your memory, in the case of concrete and wood, we sized the members for shear capacity, moment capacity, and stiffness. In the case of steel, we're focusing on moment capacity and stiffness because steel is so strong in shear that it's very rare that that's the mode of failure. The normal procedure that we've outlined in the past talks about shear design, then moment capacity, then stiffness. But we did make the point in a previous video that stiffness, which is based on deflection under live load, is a single step sizing procedure. So it does not have to be done iteratively. It's a simple procedure because of the fact that it's not iterative. And we're always going to start with that because it gives us a baseline to design against when we go into moment capacity. So in other words, the outcome of the design for stiffness produces a certain weight of beam that can then be used in sizing for moment capacity. And that's pretty crucial because we do have to account for the self-weight of the beam in calculating or establishing moment capacity, and we do not have to do that in the case of stiffness. So similar to the case where we were talking about um, <clears throat> stiffness calculations and also load calculations, we need to do the mathematics before we go into Excel. And the reason is that Excel does not account for the units and you will make drastic errors in most cases if you don't figure out your units before you go formulating your equations in Excel. In the case of moment for a simple span uh, element of load W total factored and length L, the moment is W L squared over eight. And we have to account for all the loads which are collectively potentially failing the beam. And we have to apply the appropriate load factors in order to assure that that beam is fully safe under all of those loads. When we go work out the units here, we have W, which is in kips per foot. We have length, in this case, length squared, and length is in feet, and feet squared will be the appropriate units for L squared. This foot cancels out with that foot, and we end up with kip feet. And it turns out that kip feet are the units that we use for a moment. So in other words, the units are already correct for using the tables, and no conversion factor is necessary. So we had a simple conversion factor for the loads. We had a more complicated conversion factor for stiffness, but we have no additional factors that we have to throw in for moment because the units will all work out correctly. This is all familiar to you, but I'm going to reiterate that we're looking at this framing plan. The spacing from column to column is 30 feet in both that direction and this direction. 
we have six spaces here. So the spacing from joist to joist is five feet. That means a joist is supporting a width of five feet. A perimeter girder is supporting a width of floor that's 15 feet. And an interior girder or a double loaded girder is supporting a width of floor that's equal to 30 feet. So we're now going to return to the active spreadsheet that we are using. And I'll remind you that the spreadsheet is crucial to us because it organizes information in a way that's visually very clear. It helps us keep track of the things that we need to be aware of. And it also uh, can work out all the computations for us. So you will recall that the spreadsheet was organized that between this line and the left hand side, we're doing load calculations. So, for example, we put in the spans of all the members, including the spacing for the joist, the spacing or the width of floor supported by a single loaded or perimeter girder, the space, the width of floor supported by a double loaded girder, or in other words, um, the width of roof. So, Excuse me, I said width of floor here, uh, but we're starting with roof in this case. So every one of these beams, the, the joist, the single loaded girder, the double loaded girder, all those apply to the roof. So we have all those lengths or spans. We have all the appropriate widths of uh, roof that are being supported by these various members. We have the loads that are being applied, dead load and live load, as area distributed loads in pounds per square foot and pounds per square foot. And using those things, we've then cal calculated the line distributed load along the beams for both dead and live for all three of the different types of beams that we're looking at. Uh, we subsequently went from there to sizing for stiffness. So we calculated an I required in the case of each of these beams. Then we found the lightest section that had an I value at least that high. I'll remind you that the moment of inertia is the technical quantity that represents the stiffness of the cross section or I for the beam. So we sized all of those and now we're going to use this weight for the joist and that weight for the uh, perimeter girder or the single loaded girder and this weight for the double loaded girder as the starting point for the next step. So I'm going to slide to the side here and now we go from stiffness sizing which we completed right here, um, we're now going to do sizing for moment strength, which is the primary subject of this particular video. Now, in each case, we're going to have to calculate a factored load for the joist, the perimeter girder, and the interior girder. So to help us understand all that, I'm going to scroll back to the side a little bit and remind us of what the loads are that we have to deal with. So for the joist, we have 1.2 times W uh, dead imposed, which is this load right here, this line distributed load. And then we have 1.6 times the live, which is this load, plus 1.2 times self for the joist. And the value we're going to use is this one, which is the weight of joist that we calculated from the stiffness sizing procedure. So I'm going to click on this and I get a formula up above 
And now I'm going to have to move things down a little bit so that you can see this. And let me see if I can reduce the size of this right now. So that'll help a little bit. So <clears throat> when I click on this cell, um, you'll notice I get 1.2 times F17. So I come over here and F17 is the line distributed dead load that we calculated for the imposed dead load associated with the decking. So you'll recall that was 20 pounds a square foot, which by the way accounted for decking, insulation, recovery board, some modest amount of load for HVAC system ducts hung from the roof and then we doubled that for some unknown future dead load because people have a tendency to come along and hang things on the building that we don't necessarily anticipate and we don't have, want to have to go and massively redesign uh, and rebuild the structure to account for those modest additional loads. So we have 1.2 times F17 plus 1.6 times G17. So this was from the live load, which also was 20 pounds a square foot. And when it's converted to a line distributed load, it ended up being 100 pounds per foot, which converts to 0.1 kips per foot. And then we have 1.2 times um, this value, which is the weight of the joist that was originally estimated from the sizing for stiffness. And then we have to divide that by a thousand because this is 14 pounds per foot and we want to convert that to kips per foot. So that's our formula. And I'm going to click up here. So now that's the number that we get, which is 0.297 kips per foot. So that's this formula right here uh, converted into um, the language that Excel understands. Things get more complicated when we try to de determine the factored total load on an interior girder, which is represented by this formula which is 1.2 times the W imposed dead, which by the way is uh, this number right here. Excuse me, this number, um, because we have a wider swash of roof. Uh, it's 15 feet wide that's being supported by the perimeter girder. So we're gonna take that times 1.2, which is our load factor, plus 1.6 times this value, which is the line distributed live load. And on the end here, we have 1.2 times W cell for the perimeter girder, which from the stiffness sizing procedure was 22 pounds per foot. And of course we will convert that to kips per foot. What makes this a little more complicated is we also have to account for the self weight of the joist as a load on the girder. And the way we do that is through this formula right here. The effective distributed load W along the perimeter girder due to the self weight of the joist is going to be W of the joist, which is the weight per linear foot of the joist times the length of joist that's being supported by a perimeter girder, which turns out to be only half of one joist because it's only supporting joists on one side and the other part of those joists or the other half of those joists will be supported by the next girder over. So we get a point force everywhere a joist lands on a girder that is half the weight of that joist. So that's what this represents. And then if we want to convert that 
to a line distributed load along the perimeter girder. We take the magnitude of that point force and we divide it by the spacing between those two. So this is half the weight of one joist. In the case of this problem, the spacing of the joist is five feet. So we're going to say we have that point force every five feet, and that's how we calculate this load. So I'm going to come and click on this, and we're going to go look at the formula up here. So it's 1.2 times F20, which is this number right here. It's the uh, imposed dead along the perimeter girder. 1.6, which is the load factor for live load, times G20, which is the live load distributed along the girder. Then we have 1.2 times M20, which is right here. It's the weight of the girder itself. So I shifted the order a little bit. Here I put the self-weight of the girder at the end, but now I'm making it the third term up here. So I apologize for that. But this is basically the, the calculation we're doing where we're saying it's M20 which is, I go to M20, which is this cell right here. That was the estimated, or excuse me, the calculated required self-weight for this perimeter girder, or single-loaded girder, based on the stiffness sizing procedure. So we divide that by a 1,000 to get it in kips per foot, and then we multiply it by our classic uh, dead load self, uh, excuse me, uh, load factor of 1.2. Then we have 1.2, and now we're calculating the load effect of the joist. So we go to B17, which is this term right here. It's the weight of the joist that was required for stiffness uh, that came out of the stiffness design analysis or the sizing procedure for stiffness. And then we're dividing that by two because only half of that joist is supporting it. And then we're multiplying it by M17, which is this factor right here, which is the weight per linear foot of the joist based on the stiffness sizing. And again, we're dividing by a thousand to get it into kips per foot. And then we're also dividing by C17, which if we go back, we see that C17 is the spacing of the joists. In other words, we have one of those half joist forces every five feet, because that's the spacing. So we go through that and we get a load along the perimeter girder of 0.917 kips per foot, which is the full factored load of the weight of the decking, the live load, the self weight of the girder from our previous analysis for stiffness, plus the self weight of the joist. So we do that sizing procedure and we end up with this number. And then finally, we have something very similar on the interior girder. Uh, the major difference is that on the interior girder, the effective line distributed weight associated with the self weight of the joist on the interior girders is now going to be W of the joist times L of the joist. Up here, it was W of the joist times L of the joist over 2 because the perimeter girder was only supporting half of one joist. But the interior girder is supporting half of a joist on one side and half of a joist on the other side. So we have the full weight of the joist, which is the self-weight distributed along the beam times the length of the beam. And again, we're going to divide by the spacing of the joist to get an effective line distributed load W 
for the self-weight of the joist distributed along the interior girders. And if I click right here, um, we'll run quickly through. It's 1.2 times this number, F23. So let me uh, make sure I've got all that on the page so that you can see. And I do. So here we have row 23, and we come over here and we find F23. So we come up here, we have F23, which is this number right here. So F23 times 1.2 plus 1.6 times G23, which is this number right here. And then we have M23, which is this number. That's the weight per foot of the beam that came out of the sizing for stiffness, which was 35 pounds a foot. But now we have to divide by a thousand to get that into kips per foot. And then we have the effective line distributed load of the joist along the girder, which is B17. So that's this number right here times M17, which is this number right here. Okay, excuse me. B17 is the length of the joist, and M17 is the weight per foot. And then we divide by a thousand, and again we divide by the spacing of the joist, which gives us the distribution along the interior girder. And this number ends up being um, 1.823 kips per foot. So now we have all those loads for the roof and we can go size those beams. So I'm going to scroll to the right here and we're going to calculate the required moment capacity, which is going to be W factored total times L squared over eight. And that will be in units of kips per foot. And you'll recall that we said this formula doesn't require any special conversion factors because it automatically comes out. If we substitute in the numbers we've got already, it comes out in units of kip feet. So let's look at our formula. It's W. Uh, which is this number right here, by the way, excuse me, N17. So that's this number. That's the line distributed factored load along the joist times the length of the joist squared, which is B17 times B17, all divided by eight. So this right here, this formula is Excel speak for this formula right here. And we came out with 33.4 kip feet. Now I want to give you some perspective here. If you were strong enough to exert a force of one kip, which by the way is 1,000 pounds, so if you think about it for a second, none of you are capable of doing that, but if you wanted to produce this size moment, you would need a lever arm of more than 33 feet. So if you had a wrench, it would have to have an arm on it, 34 feet long, roughly, for you to be able to generate this kind of moment. So at the human scale, this seems incredibly powerful, um, but, but because steel is such an amazingly strong material, we can actually get this kind of moment capacity out of a relatively modest size steel beam. And we're going to go through and demonstrate that. Now we're going to apply this formula again down here. So I'm going to click on this and we see it's in 20, which is this number right here. That's the load. 
times the length of the member squared divided by eight. So we get 103 kip feet. And then here we get 205 kip feet as the required strength for the double loaded, or the, in other words, the interior girder. Okay, so <clears throat> let's make a record here. 47.3 kip feet, excuse me, 33.4 kip feet is the required strength of the beam that we're looking for. And now we want to go find a beam that actually has that capacity. And to do that, we're going to go back to our tables. And by the way, this is a somewhat simplified table compared to the one we talked about in the previous video. And I'm probably going to go simplify all these tables in this way. Uh, it's simplified relative to what's in the book also. So here we have a list of shapes starting at this monster big 36 inch deep uh, wide flange that weighs 798 pounds per foot. Its capacity in kip feet is 13,400. So we go down all of these shapes and we have the moment capacity here for those beams. And again, for this particular table, you'll notice it's broken up into chunks. So here are four beams and that the one on the top is in bold print. You'll notice it is lighter than any of the ones below in this group of four. It has the highest moment capacity of any of those. So if your sole goal is to find the lightest weight section that will meet the specification in terms of its moment capacity. You can focus only on the bold black numbers and ignore all of these. So right here, for example, you could pluck out this W44 by 230 pounds per foot and ignore all of these. Now you might ask, well, why do we even have all those other ones? And the answer is there are other structural factors. For example, lateral stability. If the flanges aren't wide enough, the beam might tend to be unstable laterally or might need more lateral bracing. Uh, the web might get thin enough that under some circumstances, web buckling would become an issue, in which case the web might need to be stiffened by welded plates. Um, but probably more important than any of that is you might not want a beam that's 44 inches deep because it might make your building too tall or might not work with other modular dimensions in your building. Those are all incredibly complex design factors which we can't really get into um, without getting down to the nitty-gritty nitty idiosyncratic details of a specific design. So we're mainly going to play the following game. You're going to be asked to find the lightest section that satisfies some particular design requirement, in this case, moment capacity. So uh, you will always focus on these beams uh, that are in bold black print at the top of uh, this cluster of beams. Now, <clears throat> this starts with really heavy sections and they get shallower or excuse me, lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. And after all this time, we're still dealing with a pretty heavy beam, which is a W30 by 108. And the moment capacity here in kip feet is 1200. And we're looking for something more on the order of 33. So we're going to jump to the end of this table. And when we get to the end of the table, the lightest beam that they bother to list here has a moment capacity of 47 kip feet. And you'll recall we were looking for something on the order of 33.4. So what they're saying is a W10 by 12 is actually oversized for what we're doing. So we're going to go back 
to our Excel table and we're going to go write W 10 by 12 as the lightest W section satisfying our moment requirement. And we're going to put here what that moment capacity is, which is 47.3, which is substantially over designed relative to the 33.4 that we were uh, targeting. So we basically went to the bottom of their table and we're not going any lower than that. We could probably extend the table if we wanted to, but typically uh, we don't do that because that's a pretty light beam and it's going to work fine for what we're doing. And in fact, here's an interesting point. We've said we need a W10 by 12 to satisfy the requirement of moment strength. But in a previous design, we came up with a W12 by 14 that was necessary for stiffness. So we actually have to satisfy the criterion for stiffness, which requires this, the criterion for strength, which requires that. And we pick the heavier of those two because we need to satisfy both criteria. So what we pick is this result from stiffness, and we say the final section that satisfies the requirements of both stiffness and moment capacity is a W12 by 14. Now we came down here and we came up with this moment of 103 that we need. So we're going to go back to our tables and we start scanning up here and we pass 103 and we arrive at something that has a moment capacity of 110 kips, kip feet. So this works because it's greater than 103. It's a W12 by 22. So now when we go back to our Excel table, we write that in a W12 by 22. And you'll notice that the previous sizing for stiffness was a W14 by 22. Strength only requires a W12 by 22. It's not really that important in the sense they both have the same weight, but we need the 14 inches of depth to get adequate stiffness. So we're going to write that in here as the final section that satisfies both of these criteria. Then we're going to come here and we have a required moment of 205 and we're going to go find a, a section that gives us that. We come up to 203 and that's not quite enough and that means we have to jump up to the top here and here by the way you see this is 206 which is in the neighborhood of what we want, but it weighs 45 pounds a linear foot. We'd rather go up here and get this beam that only weighs 35 and it has a greater moment capacity. And by the way, the reason it has a greater moment capacity is because it's much deeper. It's an 18 inch deep as opposed to a really heavy 10 inch deep. So given the game we're playing is, which is to find the lightest section, which has an adequate moment capacity, we're going to go pick a W18 by 35, which has uh, 249 uh, kip feet as its strength. So I've written that strength here in kip feet, and then I wrote W18 by 35. And you'll notice, by the way, we got the same size beam from stiffness as we got from strength. So that becomes the beam. Now I'm going to scroll down here real quickly and just point out some things. Um, all the calculations for floor joist are carried out in exactly the same way. Um, so all these load calculations become the same here. So we have the same load calculation for joists as we had up above for roof joists. 
the same calculations for an interior, excuse me, a perimeter girder in the floor as we had for the perimeter girder in the roof. And likewise, the same calculation for loads for an interior girder in the floor as we had for an interior girder in the roof. The only difference is we had substantially different loads because we had, for example, a 20 pound per square foot uh, dead load on the roof. In the floor, we have 53. Uh, for the roof, we had a live load of 20 pounds a square foot. In, in the floor, it's 100 pounds per square foot. But all the calculations are carried out in the same way. Um, and so we arrive at uh, some sizes. And I think the interesting thing to note here is that for the floor um, joist, we ended up with a W16 by 31 uh, from stiffness and a W12 by 26 from strength. So this had to be the size because that's the bigger beam that can satisfy both criteria. And so we write that W16 by 31 in here. And uh, in the case of the perimeter girder, stiffness led to a W21 by 48 and strength led to the same size beam. So in other words, we write W21 by 48 with the understanding that it satisfies both the strength criterion and the stiffness criterion. And finally, for the uh, interior girder for the floor, we needed a W24 by 76 for stiffness, a W24 by 84 for strength. So we put a W24 by 84 here. Now, we end up with an interesting problem here because we got a certain sizing here for stiffness, but now, and we, we use that weight. Let me see if I can get this thing to behave properly here. Uh, just refuses. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> So now we have ended up with a heavier beam as dictated by strength. Now, this is the only case where that happened. Up above here, stiffness either controlled or stiffness and moment strength produced the same beam. The only case where moment strength controls the size of the beam is right here. Um, it's very small difference. It's the difference between 84 pounds per foot versus 76 pounds per foot um, from the stiffness procedure. And when you redo this calculation, you'll discover that, first of all, that's a neg negligible contribution to the overall load. Second of all, these beams occur in such quantum jumps that typically when you reiterate, when you do the calculation iteratively, you discover it's still substantially oversized for a moment. For example, this 840 kip feet is drastically larger than what was required, which was the 790. So even though we had to jump up to this 84, we've added so much additional capacity just because of that quantum jump that in fact when we go back and iteratively test it with this new self weight we're going to discover it's negligible so when i give you a spreadsheet it's going to have some summarizing comments and one of the things it's going to say is that if the requirement of stiffness produces a heavier beam than does the requirement of moment strength then no iteration on the sizing is required if the requirement of moment strength governs the size of the beam, then the moment strength sizing process would have to technically be repeated to make sure that the chosen section still works. And if not, a larger section has to be chosen to give adequate moment strength. 
In this iterative process, the incremental increase in weight in going from the beam size dictated by stiffness to the beam size dictated by moment strength is almost always so small that no larger beam has to be chosen to give adequate moment strength under that tiny incremental beam self-weight. For the purposes of your assignment, we, were going, we will declare this effect negligible and no iterations will be performed in your assignments uh, to account for the fact that moment strength bumped you up to a slightly heavier beam. However, for purposes of observing patterns of behavior, we will note in each case whether the beam size was governed by stiffness or moment strength. So I've written here in each of the cases below, uh, the size of the beam was governed, we're indicating whether the size of the beam was governed by stiffness or moment. So uh, for the six beams involved, Stiffness controlled one, two, three. Uh, stiffness and moment strength produced the same design in two cases. And in this one case, moment strength governed. And there's a pattern here, by the way, which I can verbalize in the following way. If you have uh, a very lightly loaded beam, it's going to tend to be quite shallow. Therefore, it will tend to be governed by deflection because deflection is extremely sensitive to the depth of the beam. So for all these lightly loaded beams, uh, stiffness is controlling the sizing of the beam. Once we get into really heavily loaded beams, uh, moment strength becomes the governing issue. So I'm going to come back to this table briefly. Um, it's not exactly the table that you see in the book. The one in the book was already simplified down in that it eliminated a lot of extraneous material, at least extraneous as far as this sizing procedure is concerned. And that extraneous material becomes the visual noise, which adds to the confusion, which we don't really need uh, in, a, in a class like this. So this, the table in the book was simplified from what's in the uh, steel manual from the American Institute of Steel Construction. Um, I have further simplified that table um, for the purposes of this video. I am going to put this um, table in this form up as a PDF, and I'm also going to include a simplified table that uh, lists the shapes and the moments of inertia, or in other words, cross-sectional stiffness, I. So in working your assignments, I encourage you, rather than using the tables in the book, you might want to just grab these uh, tables that have been visually simplified uh, by eliminating extraneous information. So that ends our third and final video on sizing steel wide flange beams from tables. So this is from chapter six, section three, subsection three, uh, and this is video C, meaning it's the third video in that sequence.